Hello there, Ron. Hey, what's up, man? I'm pretty good. How you doing? I'm doing all right, man. Pretty good. All right, so we got a big show today, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Something I've been looking forward to for a while now since we announced we were doing it. Hold on, Mike. Hold on for a second. Take your time, my man. Ah, uh, all right. So what are we talking about today? Today we are talking about the making of the Beatles album Revolver. Wow. And you know, this is episode 85. 85. Getting closer to that century mark. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Yeah, I've been, I've been looking forward to doing something on the Beatles. Um, you know, we, we, we've kind of stayed away from, since the beginning of the rock show, the big stuff, you know, the Stones, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, things like that. Because so many of these bands, you know, even the casual musical fans, music fans know something about them, right? So something like the Beatles revolver. I really like doing because not only is it my favorite album from them, but it's an important album in history. And we're going to go into that tonight. You know, what's um, that the story is actually start with that guy, George Martin. What do you think of George Martin? Well, George Martin was the fifth Beatle. I mean, he, he produced basically all their albums except let it be. Um, You know, he was involved with them. He knew them before they were the Beatles. He knew these guys. And they they call him the fifth Beatle, and and then he was. I mean, without him, they 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 wouldn't have been what they were. Mike, let me ask you, how come they don't talk about him? And he pretty much knew how to he even got a race out of the whole thing for being the Beatles producer. You know? I don't I don't agree with that, Rob. I think he's talked about a lot in Beatles history. The guy was recognized that he got knighted by the Queen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, George Martin was around for a long time. He had a history in producing even before the Beatles. They they okay. weren't his first project, uh, and they weren't his last project. He he did things. Uh, he even produced. Uh, oh well, I think he did some work with Cheap Trick at one point. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so he he had a long, illustrious career. Uh, known really for the Beatles, but he worked with a lot of other people too. Wow, I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah, because his yeah. name kept coming up, and they would talk about when he uh, was going to leave um, e- EMI. Right. They actually offered him money to stay. Yeah, well, he was their star producer. Yeah, okay. he got royalties. He started getting royalties. Yeah, I mean, there were money issues. You know, Apple Records and, and Abbey Road Studios. And, uh, you know, when the, when the band dissolved in 1970, I think it probably took 25 years for, for that money to be worked out, you know. And Martin was owed a piece of it. He got some money. Wow. Yeah. But let's talk about Revolver, okay? Uh, <coughs> let's talk about it. Yeah, I mean... It's to me, it's it's my favorite album from them. Um, for many years, I used to say the White Album was my favorite album, but over the last maybe ten years or so, I've really come to appreciate this album. Uh, I'll get into why later. Um, I just think it's, you know, kind of overlooked in some circles. Uh, most Americans will point to Sgt. Pepper, but. I think that a lot of things that they, they were doing on Sergeant Pepper, they actually had done on Revolver as well. So let's get into it. Uh, it was released on August 5th, 1966, and they recorded the album uh, between April and June of that year at the EMI Studios in London. And like we said, it was produced by George Martin. But there's two other guys that you have to talk about briefly, to at least, at least mention them in the, in the recording. And that would be uh, Ken Townsend, who was a sound engineer, and Jeff Emmerich, who was also a sound engineer. And they worked with, with Martin and the Beatles on a lot of other projects. But with this particular album, uh, you know, it, they, they used technology that they had really just invented at that point. 
Okay. For instance, uh, Ken Townsend had invented something called the artificial double tracking. And what that was is basically simply is when you wanted to double track a vocal, for instance, okay, let's say you want to have a fuller sound in that vocal. What you would do is before the automatic double tracking or artificial, I should say double tracking, what they did is the, the artist actually had to sing the part twice and they would record it and then they would impose those two tracks onto one track. Uh, it's impossible. It's, it's very hard to do. And John Lennon hated doing it. What you had to do was basically sing the lyrics exactly the same two times in a row. So if you can imagine what that, you know, that would be difficult to do. Okay. Yeah. Same inflection in your voice, same emphasis on certain words or, you know, whatever you had to do it exactly the same. So when, when Townsend invented this, uh, it, it really was innovative for the whole industry because it, it, it became, you know, a standard thing now to use this, this artificial double tracking. Uh, and Emmerich, Jeff Emmerich was, was amazing because he would come up with these techniques to, to mic certain instruments, uh, you know, to get a certain sound out of a bass drum. Uh, he would like pack it with clothing the bass drum and man, it would have like a flatter sound and it was all these little little techniques that they did on this album that make it so interesting now in the uk rubber soul was released in the year before in 1965 and in the u.s rubber soul was in 65 but yesterday and today was an album that got released uh in mid 66 Yesterday and Today is an interesting thing. It, it, it featured tracks from the Help movie and tracks and some songs that didn't make the U.S. release of Rubber, Rubber Soul and the upcoming Revolver. Revolver is the last album that the Beatles had where the release was different between the U.K. and the U.S. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that was very common. We've talked about this in other bands, the Kinks, for instance. Uh, you know, the U.K. releases were different. Than the U.S. releases, it was something that record companies did to try to kind of make the the market bigger, maybe in America, because like EPs, shorter shorter albums called EPs, uh, could have like a couple other songs that would make up the difference on there. It was just a way to market them more. But in those days too, albums weren't a big draw. Okay. By anybody, really. It was the single. It was the, the hit single you had to have. Um, I think uh, Elvis Presley probably suffered a lot from this. Because if you've ever listened to, like, Elvis albums, they're really not that good. No. Nah. Okay. Uh, some are okay. But but for the most part, he was known for the hit singles. Um, the Beatles changed that in, in, in the whole rock and roll culture. I think I think more than anybody at that point, uh, Revolver uh, w- was meant to be an album. OK, they, they had singles off it, but it, it really was meant to be kind of almost a concept album. Not exactly a concept album, but like a consistent album. There was there was a meaning behind it. Now, Rubber Soul had begun this kind of middle period for the Beatles. I call it like a brief middle period where they were getting away from their pop lyrics and writing more serious music. Now, Rubber Soul still had pop ballad stuff on it, like uh, Michelle, that song Michelle, uh, that was on there. But there was also like an influence from Bob Dylan that you could start to hear. The band was, was listening to Dylan. They, they became friends with him. Uh, they also had befriended the Birds out in California. So there was a a, a noticeable change in their music by Rubber Soul in 1965. A good example would be like Nowhere Man. You know, the lyrics of that are quite different than than anything they had ever released before. Now, Revolver would would break them even further away from that earlier sound. And, you know, it would kind of begin. Excuse me a second. Uh, excuse me. Okay, needed some water there. Uh, it would kind of begin their psychedelic period. Okay, 
Um, the band began experimenting with LSD at that point, and they were kind of taking up Eastern philosophies, John and George in particular. Um, George would stay with those Eastern philosophies for his whole life. Okay. Uh, and that's always been a part of the Harrison history, right? Yep. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the avant-garde scene in England, uh, the art the art scene, the underground art scene became an interest to the whole band, in particular, Paul McCartney. Uh, some of the songs on Revolver kind of deal with, like, dark themes. Yes, it um, does. Yeah, death even and sadness, loneliness. Uh, one track that comes to mind is She Said, She Said. Um there's that one lyric where it's, she says what it's, you know, I know what it's like to be dead. All right. They weren't going to be the, the floppy mop tops anymore with lyrics like that. So the band at this point uh, was giving up touring. Um, if, if you're familiar with any of the Beatles history, you know that the touring was insane. The fans were crazy. Uh, most of the time, especially the earlier years, you, you couldn't even hear the band over the screaming. No, they, they were going crazy with this. And it was like they needed a break. They were burnt out since 1962. They had been touring, uh, running in and out of studios to record whenever they could and running away from fans and basically making movies and just working, you know, eight days a week. To, yeah. Nonstop. To, to quote their song, you know? Yeah. Um, what they wanted to do, well, B- Brian, Ep- Brian Epstein was their, was their manager and, you know, he, he figured 1966 would be the same as 1965. They would continue, uh, recording, playing live, all that, but the band shot it all down and they wanted to make this new album experimental. Okay. Um, there were things that they were looking into. Like I said, the uh, the artificial double tracking, tape looping, uh, recording at different speeds, miking instruments in different ways. Uh, before the before this album, they had recorded everything like a live record, basically live in the studio. Boom, this is what they sound like, with very you know with no effects really at all. Occasionally there would be strings, you know, like in Yesterday, something like that. OK, uh, they would bring in instruments for that, like that. But for the most part, it was them live in the studio. But this would be totally, totally different. Now, using tape loops was a very new technology. Um, the song Tomorrow Never Knows, the last song on the album, was recorded using several controlled tape loop machines simultaneously. And that created that like whooshing sound that you become familiar with a lot of people used it jimmy hendrix would use it like crazy okay um eleanor rigby was a, was a second song on the album and it has that string octet group in it as its musical backing and you know its lyrics about loneliness uh that was a change in sound for the band uh love you too had that hindustani classical music sound through it uh, they would release during that time a non-album single, Paperback Rider, and with Rain on the on the B side. Yeah, and, you know, Paperback Rider was kind of like a straight-ahead rocker, and Rain was was more psychedelic. So I think they were they were kind of trying to bridge that line between what they were before and what they were to become, and that album really kind of. It's it is that bridge. It it kind of like shows where they're going in the future on some songs, and it shows where they were in the past. They did a lot that that album from the first the Taxman and that and Eleanor. Forget about it. That that was like that was nothing right. like that. There was never there wasn't a sound like that for them to record it, and the, they looped and they did all. It's just pretty amazing just that what these guys did and because this was definitely. A full comment of the rest of what what they're going to be doing for the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the song "Tomorrow Never Knows," the yep. last the album. That is probably the first psychedelic song ever, really. Okay, by anybody. 
uh, and definitely by them. Um, you know, that would they would continue with that kind of stuff on Sgt. Pepper, which was yeah. the next album. Now, Revolver was a 14-track album in the UK, and each of the songs were given to radio stations ahead of time in the weeks before the album, the album yeah. came in August. Um, however, in North America, Yesterday and Today would be released in June of 66, and like I said, it would feature tracks from Revolver, Rubber Soul, and the Help soundtrack that were left off the American release. So the American release of, of Revolver only had 11 songs because you had this other album that came out two months prior. Now, are you familiar with the Yesterday and Today release? Who, me? No, I never, I never, I never seen that. Okay. Uh, well, you might have heard of it because it's the one where it has the, the, the Butcher Baby cover on the inside. Oh, I think I have. Okay, it was released where, on the inside, uh, if you peeled back the picture of the band on the inside cover of the Gatefold album, I okay, remember. It, yes, it, if you peeled it, it had a picture of the band in butcher aprons with blood on them, and they're like holding like baby dolls. Yeah, all right, it's bizarre. It, it's really like I think they were, you know, and and. I, I think they were just trying to destroy their image <laughs> in a way, okay, as being this like clean cut, you know, uh, you know, like you, like you've called them the first boy band, yeah, okay? you know, like kind of like that. You know, they wanted to shed that image. They were writing their own songs, okay. The world was following them, but they were bored in the direction that they were going. They wanted to get away from the. You know, the, the, the two minute, 30 second pop song, which I mean, not to take away from that early stuff, because a lot of that early stuff is great. But what they wanted to do was really kind of expand their, their you know, expand their minds, expand people's minds. And then some of that was 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 drug influenced. OK, at that point. OK, but they they were changing. All right. And they, they were set on on changing. And when. Uh, you know, like when, when Brian Epstein wanted to put, take them out on tour in early 66, they actually shot that down because they were burnt out and they wanted to create a new sound. OK, now, uh, also at this time, they got in a little bit of controversy, OK, because John Lennon said in 1966 that they were the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Okay, and he pissed off a lot of Americans with that. Uh, it's hard to imagine now somebody, you know, saying that and it being a big thing. But in those days, you know, America was more conservative and whatever. And, and they, 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 they were people burning Beatle records. You ever see video of that? Yeah, I'd seen that people burning yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, it, and they, you know, there were people that just were never fans again of them just because of that. Okay. Now revolver, when it got released, it would hit number one in the UK for seven weeks. And it also got to number one, despite the controversy in America for six weeks. So you weren't going to stop this band. They were just too big. Okay. And you want to know the truth. They probably were bigger than Jesus. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, it's there's, possible. There's more people now than there was then, of course. Yeah. Yeah. i just, you know, they were a hit worldwide. They were selling records all over the world. So it might be, might have been quite realistic for them to say, for him to say they were, you know, as big, you know, bigger than Jesus. Now, Revolver <clears throat> would f forever expand the boundaries of pop and rock and roll. Recording wise, it was, it was groundbreaking and uh, experimental in many ways, but also culturally, it would have a huge impact. The, uh, the track, like uh, Tomorrow Never Knows would bring the 60s counterculture into the mainstream culture and nothing would be the same again. All right. They were they were like six months to a year ahead of time of of talking about acid. Yeah. OK. You know, I, I think that a lot of Beatles fans, at least in America in 66, August of 66, if you put on. Tomorrow Never Knows, that trippy kind of song, uh, which they, they 
I don't think they ever equaled a song like that as far as psychedelic. Um, I, I don't think anybody knew what the hell it was. But you, I you, think that's pretty much the um, song that led to um, Sgt. Pepper, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Because you can see the influence right there. Just Yeah, I mean, a song like well, off of Sgt. Pepper, like A Day in the Life, okay, psychedelic like that, uh, definitely came from Tomorrow Never Knows, okay? I mean, it, that was that was the song for them that set them in that psychedelic direction. Now, also a song like off of Revolver, uh, Love You Too, okay, by the one that George Harrison sings. And it's, you know, it's, it's Hindu-sounding guitar and sitar, Okay, it, it would it would kind of introduce the world, uh, the pop of rock and roll world to world music. Okay, people were not listening in the West to Indian music. Okay, but George Harrison especially would would incorporate it into their music. After that point, uh, he had started it with uh, Norwegian Wood a little bit from Rubber Soul, uh, but you know using the sitar. But he was really into that stuff by the time they did Revolver. Now, even the album cover was groundbreaking and it would win a Grammy for best album cover in 1967. Uh, it was designed by German musician and artist Klaus Vormann. Uh, the Beatles knew Klaus for many years, going back to the days when they were playing in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, he basically drew a collage of the Beatles' faces in black and white. Uh, and then there was like, you know, other pictures of them throughout their career kind of put in there. It's a strange album cover because it is in black and white at a time when most album covers were colorful. Okay. I mean, even the album before and the album after that, which would be Sgt. Pepper, the album before being Rubber Soul, had a colorful album cover. But this one is, you look at it, it's almost creepy in a way. Okay. It's like they, the eyes are kind of funny uh, on, on the four guys, okay? The four band members on the cover. And, you know, just like, you know, there's like a little little character creeping out of one of their ears. Yeah, you know? it was definitely yeah, it, trippy. It's a little trippy, a little creepy almost, too. You know, it's 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 iconic, really. I mean, they, they, they always have iconic album covers. It's not as iconic as Abbey Road or Sgt. Pepper, but it's a memorable one. Now, prior to beginning this album in April 66, the Beatles had been on a constant tour the last four years, like I said, and and Epstein uh, basically, you know, thought it was going to be the same. But they vetoed all that down because they needed a break and they wanted to prepare for Revolver. So uh, he managed Brian Epstein managed them immaculately. OK, he had them totally down on how to promote these guys and one thing that he did during this time while they were kind of just relaxing is uh they did kind of some one-on-one interviews in a newspaper called the evening standard in london and it wasn't often that the band was interviewed one-on-one they were usually done as a group and that was on purpose as well because brian brian epstein wanted to show them as one unit but this was really like one of the only times under his management that they would do this. And they were published weekly for, I guess, about a month period because there was four of them. OK, so you know, one week you had a John interview, one week you had a Ringo, and then you had a Paul and you had a George like that. Now, in their free time for that they had here at the beginning of 66, Lennon, Starr and Harrison would spend a lot of time tripping on acid. All right. And when they had been doing that for about a year, McCartney, on the other hand, never wanted to do it. He was interested in the London art world and underground artists, and he would be involved with that. And he got John into that also, because that's how he eventually would meet Yoko. Wow. You know, Yoko Ono was an artist. Yeah. OK. So, you know, an underground artist, actually. Now. The interests of LSD and the avant-garde art world and Eastern philosophies would all converge on Revolver in the songwriting, uh, especially with Harrison's songwriting, which became much more profound and in a way George kind of came of age during, yeah. uh, during this album as far as his songwriting. And I want to talk about each of the songs. 
Yeah, I was I was just gonna ask you because there's that um there's that thing in the um I'm only sleeping that got that weird backward guitar playing guitar in the guitar style playing. Yeah, he would he would George would actually rec- and I don't know how he did this because if you think about it I don't know how you could do it but he did it he recorded the song backwards. Yeah, it's crazy. He played he played it backwards, and then when you play it when you record it backwards and you play it forwards it has this like strange whooshing kind of kind of sound okay and uh it was unique okay i mean i'm gonna go into that okay because we're gonna talk about each of the tracks a little bit now one of my favorite beatles oh, songs. i just want to say another thing this album was not that long it was only 35 no. minutes and a uh, second was, it, it was actually under 35 i think it was like 34 and change yeah uh, 14 songs. Uh, I think there's only one or two songs that are over three minutes. All right, so it's it's a to me that's perfect. It's a perfect album. Yeah, it's just it's not long, and it's it's got enough songs, and it's it's just perfect. Great songs. It's got a bunch of great songs. Oh yeah. Now first track is Tax Man. Great right? song. Tax Man is 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 one of my all time favorite. Beatles songs, uh, one of my all-time favorite George Harrison songs. It's just a perfect opener to the album. And it's different because they never opened an album with a George song before. Okay. Now, George Harrison wrote this song as a protest against the Harold Wilson labor, labor government in the UK. Yep. Okay. Now, at the time, top earners like the Beatles had to pay 95% of their of their income into tax okay so they were getting killed they weren't making any money in fact tax man is the beatles very first song that you could be considered like being socially conscious all right it's really kind of like their first kind of song other than about you know girls and love and things like that um it's also a bit of a proto-punk song in a way okay because it has kind of like that that part where John Lennon is saying like he's name checking. He goes, you know, Mister Mister Wilson and Mister Heath. Okay, Ed Edward, you know, Wilson is the prime minister of the Labour Party, and he was in charge. But Edward Heath was the Conservative Party leader at the time who wasn't in charge. So he was kind of name checking both of them in like a snotty kind of way. Wow! If you listen to it, yeah. so it was kind of like you know. It was definitely like if you can point to Beatles songs being proto punk and, you know, influence the punk scene, it would be a song like Tax Man. Okay. But George Harrison sings the lead vocals, he plays rhythm guitar. But a lot of people don't know. Uh, Paul McCartney plays bass like he always does, but he also did the guitar solo in the middle of Tax Man. Now, most people think that's George Harrison. Oh, shit. It's not. It's Paul McCartney. Okay. And the reason for that was when they were recording it, the, Harrison was having a problem with the solo. Okay. And he admitted this years later. He said he always, you know, appreciated how, how Paul just got up and did it. Like they were kind of like, it was starting to get frustrating that he couldn't figure it out. And he was trying different things. It wasn't working, and he was spending a lot of time on the song. And Paul just came in and grabbed the guitar and did it in one take. And that solo is one of their best solos ever in the whole career of the Beatles, I think. Wow. Okay. And George, you know, a lot of people think it's him. It's actually Paul doing it on a George song. So Now, Eleanor Rigby is the second song and you know, it, it, it's totally different from tax man. You couldn't have two opposite songs go back to back and it would be part of a theme. Actually, the fact that two songs didn't sound the same in a row was, was intentional on this album. Okay. Uh, they did not want two songs to sound alike back to back on this album. The song deals with kind of the terrors of loneliness uh, it, it, the characters in the song are an aging woman named Eleanor Rigby and a lonely priest named Father Mackenzie who writes sermons that nobody will hear. Okay. And 
he eventually presides over Eleanor's funeral. Okay. So Paul McCartney actually was, was when he was writing the song, uh, he was using the, the, the character named father McCartney instead yeah. of Paul McKenzie. And, you know, he kind of thought about, it. he says, I don't know if I want to use like my father, you know, for that. Okay. So he, they, he, they actually went to a phone book and they looked up some names and they just came up with McKenzie and they used that. So, this Paul McCartney written song is like a totally sh- big shift from the traditional love theme songs he had written earlier in the band's existence. The, the, the lyrics were actually group written. Okay. They, the, the whole band had a hand in, in the lyrics and, but not one Beatle plays an instrument on that song. Okay. George Martin, the producer had arranged for a string octet to do all the music. Okay, so they don't play anything on that. It's just it's just Paul singing. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now, what's interesting too, and I didn't know this, and then when I thought about it, I said, you know, I can kind of hear it. Is George Martin was influenced by Bernard Herrmann's soundtrack for the movie Psycho. Okay, and if you think about it, the 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 song. You know the, the 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 octet sound is does kind of sound like Psycho. Okay, you you know what I'm talking about in Psycho. Yeah, you, dun, 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 dun. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of similar in some ways. Now, if you think about it too, the the two first songs on Revolver are really totally different than anything you've ever heard on a Beatles album. So you knew when you were listening to this album, this was going to be different. Yeah. Now, here's the track we, we mentioned earlier, I'm Only Sleeping, track number three, okay, on side one. Uh, it features Indian-sounding guitars. Uh, Harrison actually recorded his uh, guitar s- solo on it in reverse. And when Martin put it into the song the correct way, it sounds like a sucking sound or a, a whooshing sound. The song was very experimental because of the various speeding that they used, okay, in the recording technique. Uh, the song was recorded at a faster speed and then played back, and it gave it kind of like a dreamlike psychedelic quality to it, okay? And they actually did some speed changes on John Lennon's vocals on it, too. If you listen to it, it's not the same sounding through the whole song. Wow. Yeah. Uh, love You Too. And two is spelled with the one O, love you too. And that's Harrison's first attempt at writing something in a Hindustani classical style. Uh, He had been introduced to the sitar in 65, and he used it on the song Norwegian Wood on Rubber Soul. Uh, There's some fuzz tone guitar on that song as well, love you too. Uh, But it's mostly the Indian musicians from the Asian music circle. Yep. who provided the instrumentation. Uh, there's stuff like a sitar, a tabla, a tambora. Uh, it was the first attempt at a Western pop star to copy a non-Western type of musical structure. No one had ever tried that before in the West. Okay, And obviously, you listen to it, the song was influenced by LSD. Okay, And uh, it kind of deals with releasing and accepting your hidden and inner inhibitions the song okay uh i love that song Uh, you know it's it just has a uh, it's a short song it's only like two and a half minutes okay but it has that build up for about a minute before the the indian musicians kick in like there's like a little bit of a guitar and then it just kicks in with all the all the Indian musicians. It's just, a, I don't know. I think it's just a cool song. It's magical. It's like, holy shit, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> it's, it's mystical. It's mystical. Yeah. It's yeah. like, great. Yeah, it is. Cause we're, they were definitely touching a different kind of sound, man. Yeah. I mean, look, their influences, these weren't the same guys that started in 62. They, they no. had been around the world. Uh, they had been exposed to things that they would never have been exposed to in England. Uh, you know, I mean, the Indian stuff would be a big influence on them and it would end up, they'd end up going to India. And I think they met the Dalai Lama and all that. Like that was like about two years later. Yeah. Cause you know what? They technically became almost like a, 
like a studio band. Well, they did, starting with Revolver. Yeah, yeah Revolver. That would, they would become a studio band. Like, they wouldn't, they were like very, they'll play the studio to a million albums. Why even go out there and work, you know? You know, and it was too much of a hassle, okay, really, to tour. This band was, it's hard to, like, imagine in, in 2020 what it was like in 1966. There, there were no PA systems. There were no PA systems. So you couldn't hear the band over the screaming. Okay, people weren't just like sitting and listening to the Beatles. They were screaming their heads off. The girls, even the guys, okay, were screaming their heads off. You couldn't, you know, and, and, and all the, you know, the, the touring for a rock band at that, at that caliber in, in, in 66 and 65, they, they, they really, you know, it wasn't easy like it is today. OK, there's, it's it's a lot easier. Not that touring is easy. Touring is always hard. But but in general, today, things are just a lot easier. There's a lot more accommodations for these people. Uh, they're kind of kept separate from other people in, in hotels. In those days, they would like, you know, they'd come in their room and there'd be like three fans that broke in by climbing in through the window. Wow. <laughs> okay, you know, and, I mean, there was all that kind of nonsense. So it, it became such a problem for them that, yeah, they wanted to be a studio band and experiment. That's what that's where their heads were at. Uh, the next track after Love You Too is um, it, it's a beautiful McCartney song called Here, There and Everywhere. Uh, he was influenced by the Beach Boys song God Only Knows from the Pet Sounds album. Uh, and actually... God Only Knows itself, written by Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, was actually influenced by the Beatles' Rubber Soul album. Wow. So they kind of like, you know, they they influenced each other big time. Uh, That song is about living in the moment, especially from kind of a romantic perspective. Now, Love You Too, the prior song, was more about a, a sexual or hedonistic perspective. Okay. So the two tracks side by side are almost a complete human experience of physical and romantic love. And I think the sequencing of the album was intentional. Okay. Uh, That's something that's kind of lost a little bit. And we've talked about this a few times, you know, back when you had a side a and a side B, yeah, you know, it was important. You could you could pass a message along just by the way you sequence the songs, okay? And uh, you know, for instance, remember Guns N' Roses? The A side was about uh, drugs, and the B side was about sex, like yeah. that, okay? But you know, what they did is they didn't put two songs that were the same after each other. Nah, very different. Very different. Now the last track off of, uh, I'm sorry, the second to last track off the side one is Yellow Submarine. Okay, now let me ask of Yellow Submarine. I thought it was like a nursery rhyme, something for kids. It was, okay. It was written with the idea of kids in mind. Um, it was written also, and it was Lennon and McCartney wrote it, but also uh, fellow superstar Donovan Okay, was involved with the writing of it. And Ringo, the song was going to be a vehicle for Ringo Starr, okay, and his kind of offbeat humor. So on June 1st of 66, during the recording sessions, a group of the band's closest friends got together in the studio to create what they called a nautical atmosphere, okay? And some people that, like like one person that sings back up on is Marianne Faithful, uh, Mick Jagger's girlfriend. OK, she's in the background. There's a bunch. There's a bunch of people. OK. And um, what they would do is they would they would kind of mix recording like gong sounds, whistles and bells, sailing sound effects. They had a big, uh, big metal tub of water that they used to make the wave sounds of the submarine that you hear in the background. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, George Martin brought in a, a, a recording of a Sousa march. OK, and that was thrown in after uh, Star says the lyric and the, and the brass band is playing. And then, you know, they would have the brass band in the background. 
Lennon recorded the background voices all in an echo chamber. Okay. Uh, one thing that they did uh, that <laughs> was kind of insane because you probably could have killed John Lennon. Uh, it, there was there was something where, or Ringo Starr, I should say, because he's he's singing it, not John Lennon. Uh, they wanted to record it uh, a sound almost of being underwater, so they put the mic underwater, but they covered it with a condom. <laughs> okay, and some other stuff around it. Now, had Ringo touch that thing <laughs> I, think, I don't think the condom would have stopped the electricity going through maybe i don't know okay but he could have been one of the first people ever electrocuted in a, in a recording. wow yeah but uh you know his his lead vocals are simple but they're captivating it's like it's the kind of song that you know it's not a beatles song that i go to okay it's great in the context of the cartoon the movie okay uh You've seen that, right? Seen what? The the Yellow Submarine movie. I never seen that movie. No, it's a cartoon. I seen it, but you know what? It's the kind of thing that I seen like in parts and bits. So I never really sat down. You never sat down and watched it. Yeah, it's it's a trippy movie. It came out like not too long after Revolver. Uh, <laughs> you know, it 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 features that song, a bunch of other songs, and it's got these characters called like the Blue Meanies and. Yeah, I remember the blue meanings and those yeah. stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but I, I, it, but it's the kind of thing that I can probably see the first five minutes, and then I'm like, okay, I gotta change this. You just gotta, you know, pop a couple of edibles and just... yeah, <laughs> if you're gonna watch it, definitely be edible. Because other than that, you start watching, you're like, what the it's, fuck is this? Yeah, it's boring. <laughs> it's boring. You know. But anyway, uh, the 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 first side would end with a classic, and that would be the song "She Said She Said." Yep. Okay, now, it continued with the theme of no two songs in a row sounding alike. Okay, you couldn't be any more different than Yellow Submarine and She Said, She Said. Um, The lyrics refer to a conversation the Beatles had with actor Peter Fonda. They were partying with him and the birds in California. Uh, Everybody was tripping. And... Fonda was, um, I think they were like in a room and playing pool. And Ringo was like, the, supposedly like, you know, shooting the, the cue stick backwards. Like they was tripping and he was using the thick end of it to hit the ball. Or something yeah. Like wasted. And uh, Peter Fonda started talking about how he knew what it was like to be dead. Because he had been shot as a child accidentally. Wow. And, and he had to get an operation and he actually died on the operating table for a minute. So he knew what it, he would say, oh, yeah, I know what it's like to be dead. All right. That's wow. how that's how John got that lyric. OK. Um, the musical arrangement of the song was actually fragments of three songs that Lennon had recorded. And the way the arrangement was going to be became an argument for the band. Okay, and Paul McCartney walked out of the studio. And so that's a different thing because now you gotta wonder who plays bass on it. Okay. And it's not it's not Paul, it's actually George. Wow. Yeah, he didn't come back. Paul was mad he didn't come back for the you know recording of that song. So Harrison just picked up the bass and played it played that part. Um side two would start with Good Day Sunshine. Yeah, that's another great song. Yeah, yeah. Now that's that's a typical kind of Paul McCartney song. Okay, yeah. I think you know it's like anything he could have written, you know. Uh, but it's really kind of sophisticated because George Martin, the producer, plays like a ragtime piano on it, and he recorded the piano at an off speed too. So when it was recorded back, when it was played back, I should say normally. It actually sounds a little faster than it than it actually was. Okay, now Paul had actually admitted listening to a lot of John Sebastian and the Love and Spoonful. Okay, uh, around that time when he wrote Good Day Sunshine, um, it was really kind of the main influence for the song, the Love and Spoonful. 
and the group harmonies at the end of the song to me are unforgettable. Just the way yes. the way it ends, you know. Uh, the next track is is one of my favorite Beatles songs as well, "And Your Bird Can Sing," and it was written mostly by John Lennon. Now, Bob Dylan was was definitely, I believe, an influence on this song because it has kind of like a, a shady put down, similar to the way Bob Dylan uh, did in positively fourth street you know yeah. the, you know the lyric on that you've got a lot of nerve calling you yeah. my friend you know that whole thing and, yeah and and this song and your bird can sing you know it's kind of like if you listen to the lyrics he's kind of putting this person down say oh yeah your bird can sing but you know you can't hear me like that wow okay so people always wonder you know uh, you know who's he singing it to okay uh, he's singing it to someone that has seen seven wonders. Okay. But yet can't relate with him. Okay. So some people think it's, it's, a, he's singing it to McCartney. Okay. Uh, Lennon actually, uh, is on the record saying that it was about Frank Sinatra. Okay. There was, there was a recent, I think Esquire magazine article, an interview with, with Sinatra, where Sinatra put the Beatles down. OK, he doesn't name them by name, but he says, oh, you know, a group of four moppy top guys. I need a haircut kind of thing. And then, <laughs> <laughs> but it was also it was also a reference in that same Esquire article to uh, Sinatra being like a guy who's like fully, fully independent and he can get anything he wants. OK, so there's another interesting theory on who he's talking to, and it kind of makes sense. Remember I told you that Marianne Faithful was was on some of the backing vocals of Yellow Submarine? Yeah. Okay. Marianne Faithful was Mick Jagger's girlfriend at the time. Now, Bird, when you say, and your bird can sing, Bird is another word for girl in England. Okay. Now, you've heard the British refer to that, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is he singing to Mick Jagger? Whoa. Okay, and your bird can sing, but you can't hear me like that. What was that about? Yeah. So it's interesting. You know, the, and, and the Beatles and the Stones had a, a a good relationship with each other. They got along. They were not enemies. The press wanted to make them kind of be like that, but but they, they never were. In fact, the first Stones song uh, that they ever, uh, one of the first songs they ever released was a Beatles song that, they just gave the Stones a song called "I Want to Be Your Man." All right, that was written by uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon. The Stones did that song; it was a hit for them. So they they got along, okay. And but they would kind of like take jabs at each other once in a while. Uh, the Beatles kind of like to to do that, okay. To they, you know, remember in the Lemmy movie uh, when he he talks about how you know. The, the difference between the Beatles and the Stones is kind of misunderstood because people think the Stones were the bad boys. Yeah. And the Beatles were like the, the good, clean cut. It was really the opposite. Yeah. All right. Because the Beatles were like these four, you know, working class guys from Liverpool, didn't have any money, really. And the Stones were like art school students. Okay. So, you know, it, it's a different background. So, yeah, it was very different. Very different. Now, um, one thing about Anya Burke can sing is is Harrison and McCartney play dual lead guitar parts. Okay, so you have McCartney picking up the guitar there and playing with Harrison. Okay, uh, it's not it's not John Lennon on guitar on that song, even though he's wow. sing, even though he's singing it. Okay, now the next track is a song called "For No One." And that was inspired by Paul McCartney's relationship with English actress Jane Asher. Uh, this recording featured McCartney on bass, piano, and clavichord. And Starr was on drums and other percussions. It was the start of a habit that Paul would sometimes do in recording, leaving out John Lennon and George Harrison, or leaving them with like very little guitar work. And later on, in later sessions on different albums this would be a big problem for the band it would kind of contribute to their breakup okay oh wow mccartney was getting a, you know a little too much in the studio from what i can understand 
Now, Dr. Robert is the next track. Yeah. And it's one of my favorite Beatles songs, too. It, it was written by Lennon, though McCartney kind of now in later years says he co-wrote the song. Uh, it's a guitar-based song similar to Enya Berg Can Sing. <laughs> Lyrically, it's like, if you listen to it, it's the most obvious drug use song that they had written yet. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like celebrating a doctor feel good type of physician who would give you injections or whatever pill you wanted. Okay. Now, I think it was years later in a Playboy interview, John Lennon said that that he was the doctor feel good, that he had all the drugs <laughs> for, wow. the, for the band. You know, um, I think it was also uh, uh, they were reacting to the Stones song Mother's Little Helper, which had just come out on the Aftermath album when that was released in 66. OK, so the lyrics to Mother's Little Helper is taking that little yellow pill. OK, because the, the mother's bored from just staying home all day. OK, feels like she's getting old. You know that song. OK. Yeah. And, and they write, you know, Dr. Robert. OK, a similar kind of theme. Um. The next track is called I Want to Tell You. And Harrison wrote this. Now, it's the third Harrison song on Revolver. Okay. And yeah. it's the first time that they would ever have three songs from Harrison on an album. It was usually just two. Okay. And it's a song about kind of like the avalanche of thoughts that he had found hard to express in his life. Uh, the song is kind of, you know, he's saying, I want to tell you something. Okay. He also was, you know, experimenting with acid like crazy. So there was a lot of influence with that. Uh, yeah. The track was, would, would be performed most of the time by George in his later life as a solo artist. Okay. He would bring that a lot into the, into his set. Uh, it was also covered by Jeff Lynn from ELO. And the Smithereens, and of all people, Ted Nugent covered that song. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. The next track is called "Got to Get to Got to Get You Into My Life." Uh, yeah. Great song. Uh, it's got a surprise though. Do you know what it's about? Um. Is it like it's almost like an R and B, right? Well, it's an R and B type song. All right, so I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Is it about pot? It's about pot. Okay, and you know, you listen to it; it's written like a love song. Yeah. Okay, you think he's talking about a girl, but <laughs> he admitted he's actually talking about weed. <laughs> he's talking about a fatty. Smoking talking about nice a big, big fat, fatty. Fat, fat, big fat split. Now yep. it, it has a Motown sound to it. Okay, and he wrote it. The next day after seeing Stevie Wonder in concert one night. And uh, uh, so he, he, he said, oh, I could write a song like that. Now, the horn section is a band called the Blue Flames. And when they recorded the brass, okay, of the horns, um, they actually put a slight delay on it. And it created like a doubling of the sound. Okay. And this was the sound that engineers, like I, like I mentioned in the beginning, how important they were. Yeah, uh, Ken Townsend and, and Jeff Erickson. Uh, they were they were just learning. It. This was the stuff that they thought up in the studio, and it became a standard almost. Like bands can still do this kind of thing today on this stuff, the double tracking and everything like that. It's still done today, um, in the same way. Now, um, the next track is the last track on the album. It was actually the first track recorded for the album, okay, when they were starting in June of 66. Now, <clears throat> now the album, I mean, this song on the album is kind of like the biggest leap the Beatles had ever taken up to that point. And I'm talking about Tomorrow Never Knows. Yeah. Which is, you know, one of my favorite songs of all time by anybody. And it's definitely, I would put it in my top 10 favorite Beatles songs. Okay. But you would say this was the game changer. It was the game changer. They were never the same after this song. They were never the same after this album. No. Nah. Okay. Uh, they had gone in a different direction. And that song ending on side two, ending the album, was like a pointing 
right to Sergeant Pepper. Yep. Okay, and and the and the other psychedelic stuff they would get into, stuff off of Magical Mystery Tour, I Am the Walrus, Strawberry Fields Forever. They never would have done those songs if it wasn't for this one. Okay, because this kind of set the tone for that kind of song. Now, it features a reverse recorded guitar, processed vocals, looped tapes to tape effects, and this repetitive syncopated drum beat. Okay, Ringo is great on that song if you listen to him. And he's not, you know, he's not really giving a lot of credit for his drumming. But there's 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 a lot of if you listen to Beatles songs, there's quite a few where he's fucking great. I, I don't know why he gets that reputation of not being a good drummer, but he actually is a pretty good drummer. Um, the lyrics for Tomorrow Never Knows were adapted from Timothy Leary's book, The Psychedelic Experience. All right. And it's about reaching a spiritually enlightened state through taking acid and meditation. This was something that, you know, if you were an acid head in the 60s, you read. You read this book because yeah. it taught you how to meditate and how to use how to use LSD. Um, originally, the song was going to be called Mark One or also The Void. OK, they were going to he was going to call it that. But Ringo Starr actually came up with the title Tomorrow Never Knows. And it kind of, you know, stuck. OK, so that's what I, thought that, I thought that was a great title for that song. It is. Because it was like a full coming. Right. Exactly. And it's, the words are never said in the song. The lyrics are, don't ever say tomorrow never knows. Yeah. OK. You're kind of waiting for it, but it, it never happens. Uh, originally, the album was going to be called Abracadabra. Wow. But another band had used that for a title of their, their album. It was also going to be called Four Sides of a Circle. OK, uh, so uh, we're going to call it Magic Circle. OK, I think Paul McCartney wanted that. Ringo Starr wanted to call it After Geography in response <laughs> to the Stones' Aftermath album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> after Geography. All right. So they actually settled on Revolver and they liked the, the reference to it being a gun, but also the revolving of a record, you know, on a turntable. You want you want to hear something funny? What's that? Did they release um, Eleanor Rigby and uh, Yellow Submarine on a single? Yes, they did. Okay, I think it was the only single on the album. <laughs> what was that? Why would they release Don't So Pretty too? That's not that doesn't sound like an A and a B. It's like well, it's interesting what happened with that. Um, it was released as a single on both sides of the Atlantic, but because of the controversy with with uh, Lennon saying the Beatles are bigger than Jesus. In the U.S., Capitol Records, who were in charge of the Beatles here, um, basically said, we're not going to push that side of the single. We're going to push Yellow Submarine. And it would make it to number two in America. Yeah. Now, in England, Eleanor Rigby and the flip side, Yellow Submarine, made it to number one. Wow. Okay. And and I don't know if they I guess it was an unintentional double A side. Okay. Remember you asked me one time what double A yeah. sides are? Uh, I think it was an unintentional double A side. They were just so big that if you put a single out, they would play both sides. Wow. You know, and, and it, you know, Eleanor Rigby I think it I'm trying to remember if it went if it charted in the States. I think it did. I think it was a top 10 or something wasn't number one they were kind of slipping a little bit here in the states because of those comments but when i say slipping i'm not saying they dropped out of the top 20 they were still top 10 yeah okay so it's not really slipping now the album got released in august of 66 many uk critics praised the album as revolutionary and their most experimental pop record ever recorded okay the U.S. critics, again, was slightly cooler due to John Lennon's comments. And some of the American fans were confused by the lyrics, like I mentioned before. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're kind of like, what's, what's this like weird shit? You know, what is this sound? But it just wasn't in the public conscience yet. It was like a year away. OK, 
Uh, the album's release in America also began their breakaway from being a female fan-oriented band to a more male-oriented serious music fan base. Okay, and that would continue as their fan base through 1970. I think a lot of I think until Revolver, they had way more female fans, especially in America. Yeah. Than than male, they were just considered oh a boy band, okay kind of thing. Even though their songs were way stronger than that, they were writing their own music. Yeah, of course. Uh, but once they did Revolver, something something clicked, and it was just such a more serious album. You know, if you think about it, like if there were a teenage girl, 15 years old, she's been into the Beatles for the last two years, puts on revolver. And the first song is tax man. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole yeah, different, a whole different thing. Where's my love yeah. song? Where's my, where's my, you yeah. know, she loves you. Yeah. 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 You know, it's just, it wasn't there on that album. Even rubber soul, the album before it had like Michelle. Okay. And some love songs on it. Yeah, uh, but it, you know it had some serious songs too, but not as serious and darker as the songs on Revolver. You know, they were definitely dark, and they definitely went in a change. So they kept changing it, so it was never the same thing. And then it happened steady pace. It will get to a certain thing. Then it'll go down. Then it'll go up. Then it'll go down. Yeah, and and one thing though too that was ramping up at this time was the Vietnam War in '66. Yep. Now, in 66, 67, we were still kind of pro the war. Most, most, most Americans were for it. OK, uh, the Beatles in 66 came out against it. And that wasn't a very popular stance by 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 a lot of people in America. But again, if, if, if the Beatles was, were not dropping out of sight, they, they were still top 10. They just weren't like number one anymore yeah. at that point. And, you know, in my opinion, I'll, I'll basically end it here pretty much. Uh, Revolver is a better record than Sgt. Pepper, in my opinion. A lot of people say that. Okay. I think in America, because of the release of Yesterday and Today, two months before Revolver, because of the controversy of John Lennon's comments about Jesus, and... The overall packaging of the album where you had three tracks left off put on yesterday and today, so you had to buy that, and then, you know, the 14 tracks being released in the UK. So it, it kind of, and again, thank God it was the last time that ever happened, but I think the album for many years kind of got over overshadowed by Sgt. Pepper, which came out a year later. Yeah. Okay, it was... I think uh, actually a little less than a year later, about 10 months later. Okay. So, you know, it, it, it do- didn't always get the rec- recognition, but I think in later years now, maybe in the last 10 or 20, it's kind of like crept up there as on equal par with Sergeant Pepper. I think there's songs on, on Revolver that blow away certain songs on Pepper. Definitely, man. Because, let me tell you, the fucking Revolver album was like, you know, that came out, and then later on, when you hear the credits, everybody talks about um, Sergeant Pepper, but once they mention that, then everybody starts talking about Revolver. Yeah, yeah. You know, because they, they just go hand to hand. Yeah. I mean, they do. And they, they, it, it, it that break away from, from that popper, poppier sounds, they were doing that with Rubber Soul. Not a hundred percent. They were maybe fifty percent in that. And then with Revolver, they had you know given up touring. They retired from touring. Uh, in fact, they did tour in '66 because they had some obligations to do a world tour. Uh, but that was going to be the end of it. And they never performed, even though the album was out. They never performed songs from that album. Wow! And they went on tour after the album was released. But they didn't do. I mean, you couldn't recreate Eleanor Rigby. Live, nah. Okay. You couldn't recreate Tomorrow Never Knows. The nah, that would have been hard. It'd be impossible. You couldn't get those sounds. Yeah. Okay? Uh, even Hendrix was, you know, when you listen to him live at the time of the first album, Are You Experienced and all that stuff, 
with all the tape looping and everything. He couldn't do that live. He, he, wow. he you know, he, he just played differently. It just sounded different. Okay, it was great, but just was different than the album because you couldn't recreate that, you know. Let me ask you, uh, what's your history with the Beatles, Rob? Okay, like, is it just, is it a band you ever really got into or is it just something that was always in the background, right? Or It was something that was there, you know. There was, like, that whole thing with the, the music was so popular, people were talking about it, and then you had the breakup. Right. And, you know, you heard so much about all this stuff, so you knew, you kind of knew where you were. You were either Beatles fans or you weren't a Beatles fan or you were a fucking Rolling Stone. I always tend to lead to the Rolling Stone more than the Beatles. I do, too. I do, too. But I, I think that, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other. OK, you know, some people say you do. Uh, I don't really agree with that. I think that without the Beatles, there really wouldn't have been a Stones. They 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 kicked the door open for the Stones and all the British bands. OK, uh, you know, and again, in their in their time together at the same time in the 60s, they weren't enemies. You know, uh, these guys enjoyed each other's company. They were friends. So I don't think you got you got to hate the Beatles and love the Stones or hate the Stones and love the Beatles. It was just different, different music. It was very different music. You could say that again. It was different yeah, music. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, um, the, the, the Stones were going way more in a blues direction yeah. than the Beatles ever did. Uh, but, you know, the Stones would want to be the Beatles sometimes, too. I mean, they're, they're, when Sgt. Pepper came out, they felt they had to do a psychedelic album, and they did Satanic Majesty's Request, yeah. which, you know, some people think is a disaster. <laughs> I yeah, actually, exactly. actually, actually like it. Uh, it. It's it's an interesting attempt, and it was the, really their one and only attempt at making a psychedelic album. So it's interesting in that way. Uh, Brian Jones and stuff doing a psychedelic album, uh, but you know, it was never as good as Pepper. That's for sure. Damn. You know. Damn. Yeah. Pepper but uh, I want to. After Pepper came out, there were so many bands that tried to recreate that same thing, and they failed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, one thing I got to mention for tonight's show: uh, a member of my family that I was very close to, my cousin Marty and Gianni, uh, passed away two years ago. Um, he, I want to dedicate the show to him tonight, first of all, because uh, his love of the Beatles. And, and me being around him and, you know, picking up a lot of information, things I never knew from him, having a lot of conversations about the Beatles. Uh, the Beatles were a band that, you know, and he was older than me. He lived through the time of the Beatles. Um, I think to, through his whole life, he loved the band. And his love of the Beatles kind of rubbed off on me a little bit. You know, I, I, I appreciated his love for the band. And uh, so, you know, the fact I'm even doing an album, you know, talking about the making of this. I got to give a little credit to him tonight. Not bad, Mike. Not bad. And you brought the you brought your A game again, and we have another deluxe show. Thank you um, for this um, great um, Beatles, uh, great Beatles uh, revolver album, which is one of the most talked about album, and it definitely you definitely saw a glimpse of the future from uh, seeing that album and. The band changed over the age. The band was never... I think after that album, they, they were never the same. They didn't do any no. pop music ever again, right? No, I mean, well, sort of. I mean, you know, some of the McCartney stuff. I mean, I guess you could say Long and Winding Road or Hey Jude yeah. is like a little poppy. Uh, nothing like the stuff they did earlier. I yeah, that's what I mean. It was a totally yeah. changed band. They weren't playing that like popcorn, like like... You know, yeah. popcorn, rock and roll. I called it like everybody pop. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, they they, you know? they never they never played. You know, love me do again. You know, yeah, <laughs> they never did that again. <laughs> all right, Mike. Thank you for another great show and all your time. And um, guess what? Don't get drunk. Don't get get lumped up. up. See you next week, brother. Take care.